Thank you very much for coming. Again, welcome to our home. The, um, the lecture this week, last week we ended um, the uh, discussion, our thoughts, with the Git Hanosha, the sciatic nerve, where Yaakov was struck by the angel, again, Esav's angel, and its connection to children. So again, let's continue with this idea of listening to God. Again, this is our third lecture on it. The Torah tells us that we are forbidden from eating from the sciatic nerve that is found in the hindquarter of an animal. In most places, Jews only eat from the front half of the animal. Uh, the removal of the vein is tedious, and it's also difficult work, so it's just easier uh, to sell the back half of the animal to non-Jews. Of course, such cuts as <clears throat> the filet mignon, T-bones, and other tasty cuts are found in the hind quarter. Now, in Israel today, you can actually order these cuts. So the gid anusha, the sciatic nerve, can be removed but with difficulty. And I think this is an allusion to our children. All children are important. Some are just more difficult to reach than are others. But just like in the state of Israel, where we are able to enjoy the hind cuts granted with difficulty and a higher price tag, so too we need to deal with all of our children, especially the difficult ones, because the results will be spectacular. Many are diamonds that are just waiting to be polished. Most of the treasures in life are hidden. They require us to dig deep into the earth and even get a little dirty doing so. We see that God had Yaakov wrestle with Esau's angel all night. Yaakov is victorious. He regains his confidence and he's no longer afraid or distressed. He has defeated Esau's angel and now he is prepared to meet Esau himself. However, before he will let the angel go, Yaakov demands that the angel bless him. But why? Really to teach us that whenever one, ha was, one is in a situation that is difficult, one cannot leave that place without a blessing. Learn something. Take away a lesson in life. Grow. You know, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. The angel tells Yaakov that his name will no longer be that, which comes from the word Akev, which means heal, alluding to a lowly person. From now on, the angel says that his name will be Yisrael, as it says in Vayishlach 32, 29, for you have become a prince among angels and man. He will no longer be seen as he heals someone devious, but Yashir Kael, one who is straight and upright before God. We are told that the trait that God admires the most is humility. One who sees himself as lowly, then God raises him to the greatest heights. As we say in the morning prayers, Magbiashvon, he who raises those that are lowly. You know, I found it interesting that in English, the foot is next to the soul. Now, getting back to the original story of the meeting of the two brothers after 36 years of being separated, Yaakov knows that his brother Esau is coming towards him with an armed band of 400 men. He does not want to fight. He wants to defuse the situation. After all, win or lose, he understands that war has to be a last resort. And so he analyzes the situation for openers. <clears throat> Esau is still his brother. And again, he did dupe Asa out of his birthright when they were younger. Then, when they were older, he took advantage of his father's blindness and deviously took the blessing that Yitzchak, his father, had intended for Esau. In addition, he knew that there would be illustrious converts that would be Esau's descendants, and he didn't want to prevent that from happening. So not only his fate and the fate of his family were at stake, but the survival of the whole Jewish nation hung in the background. What does Yaakov do? Well, he addresses Esav's anger. <laughs> he praises him. He acknowledges his position as the older brother. In fact, he refers to him as Adoni Esau, my master Esau. He sends some gifts, spaced out to make the presentation even grander. He plays down the wealth that he has amassed while working for Lovin, and he instructs his servants who would present the gifts to Esau 
to refer to himself as Avdecha Yaakov, your servant Yaakov. His intent was to inflate Esau's ego in front of his friends and his associates. Yaakov makes Esau look like a very special person in the eyes of his troop. Then, when they finally do meet, Yaakov moves towards Esau, bowing seven times with humility, but at the same time with an air of confidence. He was successful. Instead of battle, what we see is the two brothers fall on each other's necks and weep. An important lesson in diplomacy. The results were that Yaakov was able to defuse a vile of, of a volatile situation. He did so by understanding the concerns of his adversary. He did so with logic and reason, putting Asa, putting, him, pardon, putting himself in Asa's place. In fact, the fact that he had been duped by Lovan on his wedding night, he thought he had married Rachel only to find out that Leah was his bride instead of Rachel. But that may have helped him to understand how his brother may have felt after he took his blessings. So he saved not only himself and his family, but the future of the whole Jewish nation. What about God? Well, God helps those that help themselves. We need to use the gifts that God has given us to live naturally in a natural world. In fact, the word voracious bar Lukem, that God created the word Lukem, is the same numerical value as Hateba, which is nature. God created nature. As long as we put all of our efforts in what we try, God will always be there to support us. Always remember, what we own is effort. Success belongs to God. We see that when the two brothers part, Asa offers to travel with Yaakov on his way back to his father's house. Yaakov politely declines and says he really doesn't want to slow Asa and his party down. The young animals and his herds and his young children move very slowly. He tells Asa to go ahead and that he would join him in Seir, the area that Asa and his family lived in. In reality, Yaakov never intended to go that far. He only intended to go as far as Sukkot. Rashi quotes Yaakov as saying that if he, Asa, intends to do me harm, let him wait until I come to him. So from Yaakov we learn the important lesson in life, respect but suspect. We always need to be awake at the wheel. One never knows when a sharp curve shows up. A friend today can be an enemy tomorrow. So what does listening to God teach us in this story about Yaakov and his life? We need to learn to be diplomats, looking at different situations and analyzing why a problem exists and the best possible solution. We also need to look at people that are involved in our lives, learning to diffuse difficult, and possibly explosive encounters. We need to study our adversaries. Pushing problems off <laughs> doesn't make them go away. More often than not, they just get worse. We need to communicate with each other. One reason for the division between Yosef and his brothers was stated in the portion of Ayesha 34, pardon me, 37, 4, where it states that they hated him and could not talk to him peacefully. It's amazing how sometimes just a few words can change a lifetime of misunderstandings. You know, God gave us a brain for a reason. We need to use it. But at the same time, we need to know that without the help of heaven, nothing is possible. While studying the story, it's impossible not to see the hand of God, what we call Hashkocha Pratis, personal divine assistance, and Hashkocha Klolis, general divine assistance. Those scenarios that many times look the worst in the beginning are orchestrated by God to bring us to the greater good. Having faith that if we stay the course, in the end, we will be successful. We need to know with complete certainty that there is a God, a Father in heaven, who loves us dearly, and that he would never do anything to hurt us. Yes, there is tough love, but the key is it's always love. Imagine if you're walking down the street and you see a drunk lying in the gutter, lying in his vomit. What would you do? Probably shake your head and think what a waste of humanity and just walk on. What if the person in the gutter was the son of a friend of yours? Well, then you might stop and try to see if you could be of some assistance in some way. 
But what if the person in the gutter is your son? <laughs> well, that changes everything. You are definitely going to get involved. You will probably grab him by the collar, pick him off the street, and drag him home, reminding him all the time that he is better than he is acting and that he needs to get his act together. It's now become personal. And so too with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. He sees us as His children, and He takes everything that we do very personal. Yosef is falsely accused of attempted rape by his master's wife. He's put into prison. There he interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker, which led to him interpreting the dreams of Paro, which would make him the viceroy of Egypt. What was it that allowed him to interpret the dreams of the butler and the baker? Compassion. When Yosef sees these two ministers in the morning, he asks them, Why do you look so sad today? <laughs> I find that comical. They were in prison for a capital charge. Why wouldn't they look sad? True. But Yosef was a warm and compassionate person. He was observant. He noticed a change in their demeanor, demeanor immediately. Now, he could have ignored them. He had his own problems to deal with. But he cared about people which brought about his salvation. Even though Yosef himself was a prisoner, yet somehow he was able to see past his own difficulties and recognize the pain that a stranger was feeling, the quality of a true leader. Yosef would father two sons in Egypt. Each one individually would become a tribe of the children of Israel. Therefore, the woman that he was to marry, the mother of these sons, would be crucial. Where in Egypt would he find a proper wife? The measure states that after Dina is raped by Shechem, she gives birth to a daughter. The baby girl is named Asnas, which comes from the Hebrew word Avdos, meaning to rape. Somehow, her daughter is taken to Egypt and adopted by Potiphar in Egypt. The Medjur states also that when she was taken to Egypt, the brothers placed a medallion around her neck that stated that she was related to the family of Yaakov. So when Yosef was chosen as viceroy, Paro had him paraded through the streets of Egypt. His beauty was legendary, and the, some, all the young women were on the rooftops throwing their jewelry at him. Asnas also was there, and she threw this medallion at him, and he realized that she was from his family. Nothing is an accident. God is always preparing things for us. She becomes Yosef's wife and the mother of two of the tribes of Israel. So by listening to God, looking deeply into the great gift that he has given us, the Torah, there are many important lessons that we learn about life. There is, of course, so much to learn about marriage and bringing up children. It's strange, but our children should not be our confidence. We are supposed to be their support, not the other way around. It's so easy to complain about one spouse to a child. However, it's never acceptable. It's not fair to poison a child's mind against their own parent. Child rearing should not be a competition pitting one parent against the other. Children should never be forced to choose between one parent over another. Parenting requires a unified team effort. Favoritism, it's a recipe for disaster. We must make all of our children feel special and loved. Yes, they are and should be different. Different, but not better necessarily. Every person has some quality that we can praise. If you search, you'll find it. We as parents need to compliment twice as much as we criticize. If all you've learned in this lecture is this one fact, to compliment twice as much as you criticize, you've gained a lot. When we pray to God, we need to be specific. We should not be afraid nor embarrassed to ask God Almighty for our needs. He is a father and he has a responsibility to take care of his children. On the other hand, we need to examine our prayers to see if our requests are in our best interest. In fact, the word prayer is an acronym for the saying, please respond after you examine requests, prayer. We need to know 
that God always answers our prayers, but sometimes it's just not the answer that we wanted. There's a Rashi that states when King Solomon was dedicating the first temple, he made a request of God that whenever a non-Jew would bring a sacrifice to the temple, and that that request should be granted. He did not ask God to do the same for a Jew. But why? Now, we've read, a, uh, we've read a lot about scenarios that many times people find a genie in a bottle and they're granted three wishes. <laughs> Invariably, they get themselves into so much trouble with the first wish that they make that it takes the other two wishes to get them out of the trouble. King Solomon was concerned that if a non-Jew were to ask God for something and it wasn't granted, then they would somehow think the Jewish God was lacking. However, a Jew understands that God as a loving father sometimes has to say no. Whenever we have difficulties with other people, we need to understand why and what they are angry about. We need to confront situations that are important in our lives, not push them off. We need to be problem solvers. We need to learn the art of compromise. It's imperative that we always remember not to act out of anger. Anger is a hot pot. If you hold on to it, the only one that gets burned is you. So let go of it. It's amazing that an hour later, a day later, somehow, <clears throat> just not as big a deal. More often than not, anger is connected to ego, which is why the Rambam suggests that we should always take the middle road. However, when it comes to anger and arrogance, he says that once you go to the extreme, never get angry and always be humble. Work ethic, so important in our lives. If one is an employee, they have an obligation or responsibility to work all the time they're being paid. If one is on their phone or computer for personal use during that time period, it's tantamount to stealing. Taking supplies home, pen, paper, it's stealing <clears throat> if you don't get permission. You can't assume. If your boss is unethical and you feel that you are being taken advantage of, you cannot take items home from work to make up for that loss. That is considered stealing by Jewish law. Respect and suspect. Torah is all about being ethical, regardless of what others do. From Yaakov, we learn the importance of confidence. Worry can destroy a person, even if nothing happens at all. Confidence comes from the Latin word fidir, meaning trust. Of course, one must have confidence in oneself. If you think you're going to lose, guess what? You will lose. But more important than believing in yourself is that one has a strong and undeniable belief in God Almighty. There's a saying that Evid Melech Mela, the servant of a king, is a king. When we connect ourselves to the source, we can always be certain of the result that is best for us. We need to know that everything that happens in our lives and the lives of all those in the world have been programmed. Nothing is an accident. The Holy Baal Shem Tov has told us that even when a leaf moves across a meadow, it is God Almighty who is moving it. Yaakov and Yosef would not have volunteered for the difficulties and separation that they had to endure. But in retrospect, they would not have changed the thing. They understood that life is such no pain, no gain. We can say the same for the year that we've experienced. However, we have to believe that in the end, when we look back on all that we have and the world has been forced to endure this year, 2020, that somehow, some way, we will all grow and benefit from it. Admittedly, the silver lining seems a bit tarnished now, but we need to look at Yaakov and Yosef and know that as strange as it seems, salvation can come in a moment. Yosef began his day as a prisoner and ended his day as the second most powerful person in the world. We need to remember that God is always talking to us. However, we can only benefit from it if we are listening. Giving up hope is not an option. Let us proceed with confidence. We need to believe, we need to know that there's a Father in heaven who will never give up on us. 
we are never alone. And with that, maybe usher in the coming of Mashiach Tzikeno quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. Again, hopefully you've learned something from this. Uh, again, be safe, be happy, be healthy, and uh, have a Shabbat Shalom. And again, if there's any topic that you would like to hear about, please to contact us. Again, the information's on the screen. God bless and be well. Thank you again for listening.